call on him when the rain is falling down salvation for the man who cried out Jesus. if you have your bibles with you please go with me to um, ezekiel chapter 37 i'm going to read something from there but we are going to continue to talk today about the church as god's family and um just to, uh, to refresh your memory, we have been talking about the different metaphors that the Bible used to describe the church. And we look at how the church is God's temple and tabernacle. It is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. It is the house of God. It is God's vineyard. It is a city on a hill. It is God's army. But what we are focusing on in this next couple of weeks is the church of God as God's family. Now, there is a word that I just want to throw in there to help us understand how important the dynamic of God's family is to all the other things that I've just mentioned to you. I do believe that God is calling this church to be a mighty army, but I also believe that for us to be that army, we need to really understand ourselves as family, as brothers and sisters, and we have mom and dads, and we have uncle and aunties in this house, so that when we are out there advancing forcefully the kingdom of God, which we need to be militant and forceful when we are doing those things, like what Ludi is doing in the team, it is a forceful thing to take icon out there and to be able to penetrate into the community, the mindset and the philosophy and the ideology of the people in this place, because we live in a world now where people don't really want to hear about Jesus. You know, the uh, relativistic and also the pluralistic world that we talked about last week. That's the reality of this world right now. And when you stand there and start talking about Jesus, either they'll say yes to you or throw something at you or probably feel sorry for you and kind of pretend like they're listening, but they're not really listening. And so we need to come back to a place. We're going back to the drawing board and say, God, how can we preach this um, ancient gospel, which is still very powerful in this modern day? And, and I believe that, uh, you know, we need to understand first the family before we penetrate the world. And we want to get out there and penetrate and have such a great impact with everyone here on the same page and on the same uh, uh, vision, one heart and one mind. We talked about that two weeks ago. But here's a word about, the word is symbiotic. And write them down on your, your mind and, and, and also the word interdependent. There's a word that describes what this church family should be like. That for us to be able to do things out there, we need to understand that we are symbiotic. There's a symbiosis or symbiotic relationship in this room where I need you and you need me. You cannot do without me and I cannot do without you. In fact, my success becomes your success, and your success becomes my success. And your success is not uh, independent of my input. And that's what many people don't understand, that I can do without the church. I can conquer the world without the church. I can conquer the world without the pastor. I can conquer the world without uh, my brothers and sisters. You cannot. You know why? Because God designed the church to live in symbiotic relationship. You need me, I need you, because I somehow, I believe that God has given me something to help you fulfill your destiny, and God has given you something to help me fulfill my destiny. So we can't uh, look at it ourselves and say, well, you know what, I, I am myself, my God, my strength, my wisdom, I can do it on my own. I know that we live in a very individualistic world and we talk about the isms that is affecting the church today last week, but it's affecting us out there and that's why for the Samoans and the Tongans, they don't really see eye to eye on a lot of things, but sometimes we bring those differences to the house of God and you know what, in God's house, God is saying, put away your differences and focus on what makes you the same. Focus on your common ground and your common ground is Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is our Savior, He is the way, the truth and the life and we need Him, uh, He needs us, not that He needs us, but we need each other. And we look around this room, symbiotic relationship simply means that the brown needs to get on well with the white folks and the black folks and the green folks and the yellow folks. And people of different cultures and different ethnic origin need to get on well with each other. I love this church because it's very multicultural. And I believe God has called us to be that. Uh, even though I've been out and preached in many churches and some of these churches are predominantly white, uh, which is great because, you know, I want to be able to show the white folks that I can still 
tangle with them in their, you know, whatever, you know? That uh, being a brown person, I can still deliver a word in a different culture. Because that's the kind of church and people God is raising this church to be. And I just want us to know that we cannot do without each other. Symbiotic relationship and interdependent are the key words. You cannot be independent. Oh yeah, pastor, you know what? I'm just coming to church, it's been three years now, but I'm not really connected to anyone. That's an independent spirit. I don't think, I don't think you be helped or you're able to help us, even though we would like to help you, but I can't help you or anybody help you if you have this independent spirit inside of you where you're saying, well, you know, I don't need anybody else. So I want us to look at these words, symbiotic and interdependent are the key words that really describe the church of Jesus as God's family. I have a slide up there. I just want to recap from last week. Uh, do we have the slide up? On the challenging forces that really uh, work against the family or symbiotic relationship or interdependent, interdependent spirit in the house of God. And from last week, we look at the force of pluralism, and which is the coexistence of various and diverse groups and views and ideas and culture that is happening out there. But we're all here. Most of us actually represent this thing out there. But in the house of God, let's not bring out differences here in, ter in, in terms of pluralism and, and divide us in this, in this house or the church of God. Because the Lord wants us to be one and have unity in diversity. Somebody say amen. The other force that is out there is relativism. It is the belief that truth and morality exist in relationship to where you live and what you think. Meaning that truth to you is relative, that whatever you believe is true today, that is truth. And some people have actually brought that here. And I've experienced this with many people, even in my past experiences. I have somebody come to me in the old Breakthrough Church and they said, I believe that Jesus is the same as Buddha and Muhammad and all the other gods in the world. I said, wow, how long have you been in church? Oh, a couple of years. And you believe that? Let's not bring that here. Jesus is Lord and he's above all of those guys. Somebody say amen. Multiculturalism is the reality of Australia and we live in a multicultural world. And it simply means cultural diversity in a demo and the demographic makeup of a specific place or community. We live in a very multicultural community, Springfield. And this is the kind of people we're going to draw into this church, multicultural. But let's not allow our multiculturalism to divide us here. And if you uh, if felt to be married to an Asian and you are from the Pacific Islands, go ahead. Find that Asian girl and marry her. And don't let your mother stop you because it's a cultural thing. You've got to marry within the culture. And if you're a white girl and you like a brown boy, come see me. I've got a few single brown boys, you know, in this church. I can recommend them to you. You see, multiculturalism is beautiful, but let's not allow it to divide us in this house. Number four, materialism. And materialist consideration that material possessions and physical comfort are more important than spiritual values. Yes, we need material things. We need material possessions. But as a child of God... We, I think that we need to focus more on spiritual values and principles above material possession. Amen? Is it wrong to have a car? No. Is it wrong to have a house? No. Is it wrong to have a boat? No. Is it wrong to have money and travel the world? No. But when they become God, you have a problem with your Christian life. Somebody say amen. And please don't make your wife your God. Don't make your husband your God. And don't make your kids your God. There is only one God, Lord and King. And his name is Jesus Christ. Somebody say, Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and don't use Jesus to get material blessings. You know what? He won't bless you because he can see right through you. But if you're coming to God and you're part of a church, remember materialism is great. But spiritual values and principles principles are more important and of greater value and worth than these things and you know what here's the last one if we allow these things to affect us here things that is has divided us out there then what we will have what i call sectarianism 
Sectarianism is the different sect or group within the church or community. So if we allow the forces out there to come in here and we are kind of like enforcing it rather than looking at what makes us one, you know, Jesus, the Word, the Holy Spirit, the church, and all the things that we celebrate in God, we will have different sect in this room. We have different groups in this room. We, are, we have the, those that are just hanging around when we go out coffee. Uh, we don't talk to you because this is our little group. We have little groupies in the church. Let's not create sectarianism in the church. We should be just one body with one spirit and one Lord and what? One family. And I know some of you hang out with people you like and that becomes your little group. You need to break out of that little group and talk to somebody that you don't normally hang out with. Because if we're going to build a family, we're going to kill sectarianism. Somebody say, Amen. Amen sectarianism it, it's not good it's, it's it's and that's why out there we have people who are fighting against each other simply because they are from different sect and we cannot afford uh, to have that happen in our church go with me to ezekiel 37 let's read this from t um, verse 1 to 10 are you enjoying this so far I'm just going to speak to you very slowly today. I don't want to scream, but if the Holy Spirit kick in me, then I will scream, of course. But, uh, you know, I don't want to do that because I just want to, uh, I just want us to be led by the Spirit. Let's look at the internal process that we need uh, to, to uh, uh, behold in the church uh, uh, so that uh, we don't uh, just look at what we need to do together out there, but we also need to uh, pay attention to the importance of the internal process that goes on within the life of the church. And verse 1, Ezekiel 37, verse 1 to the 10. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign God, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You hear the word dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, dry bones. You haven't heard of that word? A song, sorry? Okay, don't worry about it. I'll sing it to you after. But it says, dry bone, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you. I will come, I will, I will come and, and you will come to life. Sorry. And I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And you will know that I am God. Verse 7. So I prophesy as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying... There was a noise, a rattling sound, and bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into this slain, that they will live. So I prophesy as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast, mighty army, a vast, mighty army. Now when the Lord gave me this word, the Lord said to me, David, the church breakthrough, Ultimately, my intention for you is to become a vast, mighty army. But you know, when you look at this scripture, I begin to realize that for us to be out there as a vast, mighty army and advancing God's kingdom with power and authority and penetrating into communities and cities and nations, there are important processes that we need to consider to make us strong so that when we are out there advancing God's kingdom and purpose as a mighty army, something else is holding us together. Something else is keeping us together. And I believe that this is the eternal process that we need to look at in the church uh, so that we can be strong in our pursuit of what God is calling us in this place but look at what happened first the picture that we see is God showed Ezekiel a valley of dry bones and sometimes in our Christian walk we feel like we're so dry and we feel like these dry bones in the valley but even though we may 
feel like that and see ourselves like that at times. I want you to know that God sees us differently. So God sees this, uh, this mighty, uh, uh, you know, Israel in this condition. He said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, it, that's not the reality that I see. Even though what you see is a valley of dry bones, but what I see is a mighty army that's going to come out of these dry bones. But what I want you to do, Ezekiel, to do is to prophesy, is to continue to speak. Whatever I give to you, say it because it is not your power and your ability. It is the word that I put in your mouth that's going to turn that valley of dry bones into a mighty army. And the Bible tells us very clearly that as, as Ezekiel began to prophesy and he began to speak, he began to see changes in the valley of dry bones. There was a rattling noise. The bones began to connect to bones. There was the tendons connecting bones together. The flesh come upon the... the the, the skeleton and there was skin over it and then he saw the army standing up as the breath of God enter into this vast mighty army and sometimes uh, you know when I look at the scripture and I said God sometimes I'm preaching to this church and I'm prophesying as you have spoken to me to prophesy I don't know what's going on but I believe that there is power in God's word as we continue to speak for whatever God is saying to this house. We will turn this church from just a church scattered, church that may be divided, church with many isms. I believe God's word is sufficient and powerful to make us a mighty army in this place. Somebody say, Amen. But before they become a, ma a mighty army, look at what happens here. The Bible said that as he prophesied, the process number one that happens was the bone began to connect to the bones. And to me, this is the joining of hearts and minds in this church. Because when he prophesied and bones begin to connect, I see that as us beginning to join our hearts and minds together, people in this house connecting our hearts, and so that we can become one heart and one mind in what God is calling this church to be. Amen? Because you know what? We can be together in this church today, and still our minds are divided, our hearts are divided. Even though Ludi can stand here and say, let's go out to the community and do this icon thing. And some of us can say, yeah, but our minds are not really there. Our hearts are not really there. But I believe God wants to see bones to bone connection in this very house. When God speaks something on the church, you say, my heart is there, pastor. My mind is there. This is what makes the church in the book of Acts powerful because we read it two weeks ago. It says that they were of one heart and one mind. And when you bring a church, of many people and make them one heart and one mind you know what they will become so unstoppable nothing can stop that people or that family or that church because they're so united internally bone to bone I am connected to Tina bone to bone that's why you can't divide us you know even though we may have our differences but there's something deep inside of us that connect us that cannot be divided by anything. And we have walked through life and gone through so many things together to understand that when the going gets tough, we unite. You know why? Because this is an internal thing that happens to this mighty army. What they saw at the end was a mighty army, but it started with bone to bone coming together. So we can't change the world if we cannot connect in here mind and spirit and hearts together. Amen? And then he saw another process called attendance. What does that mean for us? I believe that attendance speaks of genuine and authentic relationship. Once our minds and our hearts are together, we need to continue to cultivate genuine and authentic relationships. That's what's keeping us together. Can I just borrow you, Sam, for a minute? Because maybe I need to demonstrate this so you can see this. One heart and one mind. Me and Sam are one heart and one mind on everything God has spoken to this church about. Right, Sam? Yes. Oh, that was great. I really believe in what Sam just said. So though we can be one heart and one mind, but what we need is tendons to continue to connect us together in genuine and authentic relationship. Because you know what? If you don't build authentic relationship, eventually along the way, your mind and your heart will be divided. So I need to deliberately see Sam, talk with Sam, spend time with Sam, so that we can have the tendon binding us together. Amen? 
So you can be one heart and one, I thank you, Sam, with anyone, but if you don't spend time to have the tendons that really connect the bones together, something along the way will break you up. So in this church, to be a mighty army, we've got to have the tendons working among us. Can I encourage people in this house to please go out and see people? My job, most of it, every week, is visiting members of this church. And some people have said to me, Pastor, I thank God that you're different from other pastors that I've been under. And I said, you know, in what way? Well, you come to my house and you come to visit me. But the more I visit people, the more I begin to know and understand people. And when you walk away, you feel like there's a deeper relationship that has been forged by the Spirit of God when you go and see people. I want to encourage us here to build the tendons between us, among us, by building authentic and genuine relationship. Number three, the flesh. When he saw the bones coming together, he saw the tendons coming together, he also began to see the flesh coming upon the skeleton. And to me, the flesh could speak of ministry and services that we do together in this place. Serving God and God's people together could be the flesh that really holds us together. Now, we can be one heart, we can be one mind, we can have a relationship, but I believe that we also need to do something for God and His people together. Serving God and getting into ministry may be that flesh that comes upon us. And of course, the next thing that he saw was the skin. So he's prophesying, he's speaking these things to this valley of dry bones, and he sees skin coming upon the flesh. And for this church, I believe the skin speaks of the overall system and structure and authority that govern this house. If we focus on the bone to bone, if we focus on the tendons, if we focus on the flesh, we'll see the skin begin to come upon us. Systems and structures and God's governance all over this house. And the last thing he saw was, as this thing began to happen as he's prophesying, the breath of God enter, and there stood a mighty army. And this is what God is saying to me, David, your church cannot be a mighty army out there unless you pay attention to the eternal process and system that must be built inside the house of God. And that's why I believe that the picture that Ezekiel saw is a picture of our house. We will be a mighty army, but for us to go out and change the world, we've got to have the process of bone to bone happening here. We've got to have the tendons happening here. We need the flesh happening here. We need skin upon the whole church going on in this place. We need the breath of God, and we also need to see the life of God coming upon this house. Let me point out uh, this point here because I think my time is up. But listen to this. When we have the bone and the tendons and the flesh and the skin coming together, the Bible tells us that he began to prophesy the breath. The breath speaks of God's spirit, God's uh, uh, anointing, God's life coming upon the church. And many times, this is what the Lord has said to me, many times we come to church and we are worshiping and sometimes we struggle to feel God. And then I said, why is it that some Sunday your presence is thick in the house and why is it some other Sundays we're struggling to touch you and you know what God said to me there's division there's differences in the church you know God cannot speak or prophesy his breath upon a church that looks like they are together and they've got it together they have the appearance of oneness but inside they're actually divided and I tell you this, it's important for us to know that we need His presence upon us. The breath of God needs to come upon this church. But God will only entrust His presence and His Spirit to a house that is willing to put all the internal process and systems together. Somebody say, Amen. The Bible tells us, and you know in Psalms 133, it says how good and pleasant it is when the brethren come together in unity. There God commands a blessing. And you know what? If we don't come together and pay attention to these internal processes, God cannot bring his breath upon this church. But we need the breath of God upon this house. And for that to happen, we need to be one. We need to have bone to bone and tendons and flesh and skin and the breath of God comes and you know when the breath of God comes upon us we will stand up with life and a mighty army will come out upon sorry out of this church say amen call on him when the rain is falling down salvation for the man